morning. Hi. How did it go in court yesterday? Oh, I'm not sure. Our turn to be cross-examined today. Kathy obviously found it an ordeal. She's got more questions from the other barristers today. Uh, for a while, I thought she was going to crack, which would have suited Steve's case, but, well, she seems to be getting through it. And you're going to do even better. Uh, I don't know. There's a lot of people who'd like to see me in prison. Hi. Fancy a lift this morning? Yeah, that'd be great. I was hoping we could share our lunch break. Uh, my first period this afternoon's free, and the head's away. I thought we could sneak off and have a picnic. <laughs> it's the middle of January. <laughs> Where's your spirit of adventure? I need to hire a St. Bernard to bring us a barrel of the stuff if our hypothermia sets in. <laughs> <laughs> or I could cuddle you to keep you warm. Oh, that sounds a much better idea. The park will be empty, and it'll give us a chance to be alone together for a change. OK. I hope I can expect a bit more from you today. You've hardly said a word so far. You've let the others make all the running. I shouldn't need to remind you we're not disputing the theft. I'll have plenty to say when it can really help your case. Just as long as you make sure Kim goes down too. My job is to ensure that you get the most lenient sentence possible, which ought to be your priority. What, after what she's trying to do to me? All we have to do is present the facts, Mr Marchant. If we do that effectively, then we can rely on the jury to take care of your wife. Now, are you ready to start? See, your dad's not risk coming again today. Is he worried judge will chuck him out again? <laughs> Aye, and well, Lisa thought we'd better to keep Bill at home. She said a courtroom is no place for a baby. Oh, I don't know. When you're a dingle, it's best to learn ropes early. Yeah, but it ends us on trial this time, is it? No, that's true. We could be seeing history in the making here, Butch. The day it all caught up with Kim Tate. Come on. Mrs. Glover, I remind you that you are still under oath and apologize for the need to take you through the events of that night again. I realize it was a traumatic experience for you, one from which you may not yet have fully recovered. But your evidence is crucial to the outcome of this case. Only you and my client know what happened on that road on that night. Now, he's admitted that he was engaged in theft at Home Farm. About that, there is no dispute. But he will tell this court that he was not even aware of the possibility that he had hit you until he was informed that you were in hospital some hours later. You were in an emotional state that night, Mrs. Glover, after your aborted evening with Mr. Fowler, the disagreement with the taxi driver. It was dark. Things happened very quickly. Is it not possible that you might have misread my client's actions? I know what I saw. He drove straight at me. You were in a coma for some time after the accident. Yes, that's right. But I believe you chose to discharge yourself against medical advice. Yes. And you've since found it necessary to seek counselling. Objection, Your Honour. Mrs Glover's medical treatment is not relevant. Overruled. Her mental state is clearly pertinent to the evidence. You may proceed, Mr Keating. Thank you, Your Honour. Mrs. Glover, I'm sure you have the sympathy of everyone in this court. But I must ask you, after your traumatic experience and subsequent psychological problems, can you really be sure, beyond reasonable doubt, that my client deliberately drove at you that night? Or is it not more likely that your injuries were the result of a tragic accident, one that my client regrets as much as you do? He saw me, and he drove straight at me. They shouldn't let him do that, Betty. I'm not trying to make out like Cathy's not right in the head. No, it's just his job, love. He has to make things look better for Steve. Are you all right, love? Not really. Thought you don't want to let that brief upset you. He's a nasty piece of work, Cathy. But, Butch, why don't you go back inside, love? Let me have a word with Cathy. OK. Uh, I'll just go and check what's going on. <laughs> you did ever so well, love. I bet you're glad it's all over, though. I suppose so. I'm just not sure I've done the right thing. And you told the truth. That's all you could do. But the barrister was right. It did all happen very quickly. What if I got it wrong? Mr Margent, 
You've told the court how you and your wife planned the theft and subsequent insurance fraud. But let us concentrate for a moment on the events leading up to Mrs. Glover's injuries. Now, clearly, the theft was an operation that required split-second timing. Absolutely. Kim had planned it all meticulously. And everything seemed to be going to plan until just after I left home farm when my mobile rang. I knew it was Kim. Her name came up on the display, so I realised there must be something wrong. So you were in a state of some panic when you answered the call? Well, I was concerned, yes. She filled me in on the conversation with Reverend Thomas so I could pretend to have been present all along. Kim was very thorough over that type of detail. But there was another problem she hadn't allowed for. Yes, though I didn't realise it at the time. I was distracted by the phone call, and I hit something. I thought it was a deer. But you later found out this wasn't the case. When I heard about what had happened to Cathy, I realised I must have accidentally hit her. And what were your feelings when you learned this? I was devastated. Cathy's a neighbour, a friend. I would never knowingly do anything to harm her. Some people may attempt to cast doubt upon your remorse. You freely admitted to two crimes, and they may suggest that this accident was not an accident at all, but a deliberate attempt to silence a witness. That's not true. As far as I was concerned, this was all about money. I never wanted anyone to get hurt. So how's it going? Betty Rain Steve's trying to dump all blame on Kim. Ah, so she might be for the high jump after all. Are you going to shorten the odds? No, she's still a smart lass. Three to one against Kim being put away. Seth, I really must protest. The British legal system is the envy of the world. It's the backbone of our society. Not a subject for barroom gambling. Well said, Alan. Mind you, three to one's quite good odds. Do you want some? Only if you're offering each way. I can give you a better bet if you're free tonight. What does you have in mind? Meet me in here later and I'll tell you. Thanks very much. I might need to borrow it again later. Mr Marchant, I imagine you've used a mobile phone in a vehicle before. Yes. But you don't have a record for mowing down innocent pedestrians. Objection, Your Honour. Sustained. Please stick to the case in hand, Miss Sharp. I will rephrase the question, Your Honour. Why do you expect the jury to believe that a simple phone call caused you to drive dangerously? I was on edge. The call distracted me. But you were aware that you had hit something or someone? I thought I'd hit a deer. A deer. That's a large animal, which would suggest a large impact. Most people would stop and investigate. Why didn't you? Kim told me to hurry back or we'd be found out. So you were too busy trying to save your own skin to stop and check what or who you had hit? I put it to you, Mr. Marchant. You were perfectly aware that you'd hit Mrs. Glover. No. Indeed, it was your intention to run her over. That's not true. But you're not denying that you and Mrs. Glover were the only people on that road that night? No. Or that you were driving a stolen vehicle away from the scene of the crime when you saw Mrs. Glover? I didn't see her. But she saw you. Indeed, later she was able to identify you, which spoiled all that careful planning. Now, isn't that what was going through your mind as you drove at her? I didn't drive at her. I didn't see her. I put it to you, Mr. Marchant. The only genuine remorse you feel is that Mrs. Glover survived her injuries. Since if you had succeeded in killing her, this case might never have come to court. That's not true. It was an accident. I really care about you, Rachel. In some ways, moving in would be the ideal solution. But? But I think we should both be really sure about it first. I am sure. Are you? You must have been sure when you and Chris got it together, but that didn't work out, did it? Well, I've made lots of mistakes, but I've learned from them. I mean, what about you and your wife? Were you happy all the time? Well, I doubt if anybody's happy all the time. But you loved her. I guess her death must still be quite painful for you. My brother Mark, he died when the plane came down on the village, and I still miss him. I don't think you ever get rid of that hurt. How did your wife die? Look, I really don't want to talk about it. 
Graham? Graham, I'm... Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. Look, let's just forget about it, shall we? Mr. Marchant, I have here a transcript of a taped interview at Hotton Police Station, in which you state that the theft was both planned and executed by you, and you alone. Your wife was not involved in any way. I take it you don't deny this account was freely given? No. But you subsequently gave another account, in which you tried to shift the blame onto Mrs. Marchant, and you now insist that that is the truth. Yes. So this is a tissue of lies. Objection, Your Honour. Overruled. The defendant has admitted that the account was untrue. You're very good at lying, Mr. Marchant, as those who suffered from your financial dealings could testify. Why should the jury believe one word you utter in this court? I'd agreed to take the rap for Kim. That's why I told the police I was acting alone. It was only when I realised she was selling me out that I changed my story. Shortly after your wife started divorce proceedings against you. What prompted this startling new turn? Hmm? The news of the divorce or the person who brought it? Whilst on remand, you were visited on a number of occasions by Mr Christopher Tate, which in itself is surprising since in the past you had not got on well. But I believe it was he who informed you of your wife's intention to start divorce proceedings. Yes. What else did you find to discuss during these visits? I really don't recall. Did you discuss this case? We may have. Did you, in fact, concoct a story between you in an attempt to get your wife into the dock? Objection, Your Honour. These allegations are mere conjecture. Mr Tate is not on trial here. Mr Derbyshire? Your Honour, I intend to call Mr Tate to the stand. He will have the opportunity to describe these meetings. But it is our contention that he and Mr Marchant concocted evidence against my client. Objection overruled. You will answer the question, Mr Marchant. Yes. We discussed the case because we both know she's as guilty of the theft as I am. If anyone deserves to be locked up, it's her. Mr. Derbyshire opening Kim's defence. What did he have to say for himself? She's a loyal wife and a devoted mother. And she stood by her husband, you know even when he conned her out of all the money. <sighs> Kim. Mm. She only decided to divorce him when she found he'd turned to a life of crime and put an innocent woman's life in jeopardy. She sounded like a cross between Jonah Barton and Florence Nightingale by the time he'd finished. And they call us villains. Shouted through the door. So, you and Mrs. Marchant were both under the impression that Mr. Marchant had been up there in the bedroom all along? Yes. I know it seems odd him behaving like that when he had a dinner guest, but Kim was used to it. How long was she out of the room? A few seconds. So, apart from then, Mrs. Marchant was with you all evening? Yes. Thank you, Miss Tate. No further questions. And stay there, please. You say that Mrs. Marchant was with you all evening, and yet the Reverend Thomas recalls her leaving the room to take the rubbish out. She may have done, I don't recall. You don't recall. No doubt it was a very pleasant evening. A good meal, some wine perhaps? Yes. How much wine was consumed over this meal, Miss Tate? A couple of bottles, I think. Between you and Mrs. Marchant. So you probably drank about a bottle yourself. Yes, I didn't have to drive. It's a short walk home and we were enjoying oh, the evening. I'm, I'm not criticising your drinking habits, Miss Tate. But the jury may like to note that the Reverend Thomas was sober at this point. So his recollections of the evening are probably more accurate than yours. Look, um, 
I'm sorry I snapped at you about my wife earlier. I'm just a bit sensitive on the subject. You don't have to apologise. I shouldn't have brought it up. It's not your fault. It's just I've never really talked to anyone about her. It might make you feel better. It'd help me understand you more. Everything was fine between us at first. She was moody sometimes, but I didn't worry too much about that. We all have our bad days. But it got worse. The moods got darker and they lasted longer. Sometimes she wouldn't even get out of bed all day. I I'd come home from school and she'd still be there in her dressing gown. Well, did you go see the doctor about her? She didn't want to, but I eventually persuaded her. He prescribed a course of antidepressants, but that didn't seem to help much. So what happened? I came home and she was lying on the bed. I was used to that, but I knew straight away this was different. She'd taken an overdose. I called an ambulance, but it was too late. Oh, Graham. I've always blamed myself. If, if I'd handled the situation better, if I'd just got home ten minutes earlier. The doctors were very kind and they said there was nothing I could have done about it, but that's not how it feels when you watch someone you love dying. I can understand why you... why you want to rush into a relationship. After it happened, I made up my mind I, I'd stay single for the rest of my life. And that's never really been a problem. Until now. Mr. Tate, you were managing director of Home Farm Estates. <clears throat> that is correct. But Home Farm Stud, though on the same site, is not part of that organisation. You had no responsibility for it. That is also correct. Yet you've taken an extremely active interest in this case from the start. I was shocked by what had happened. I wanted to see the culprits brought to justice. Very public-spirited of you. You paid numerous visits to Hotton Police Station to expound your theories on the crime. Well, they were getting nowhere. I was trying to help. You accused Mrs. Marchant and her husband on several occasions. No, I was proved right, wasn't I? <laughs> about him, yes. But I'm happy to leave it to the jury to decide about Mrs. Marchant. It's not the first time you've accused Mrs. Marchant of a serious crime, is it? <clears throat> Nor is it the first time that you have decided that the police weren't getting anywhere. You felt they didn't investigate your father's death properly. They still haven't. He was murdered. And on several occasions, you have publicly accused Mrs. Marchant of killing him. I know, she did it. Even though two doctors certified that your father died of a heart attack, and Mrs. Marchant wasn't even in the country at the time. You don't know how cunning she is. She fooled everyone except me. The truth is, you're not interested in justice, Mr. Tate. Just your own vendetta against Mrs. Marchant. I want to see her pay for her crimes. That is what justice is about, isn't it? So, you kept visiting Mr. Marchant, trying to find some way of getting him to give evidence against his wife. I was doing a public service, helping the truth come out. Was that why you told Mr. Marchant his wife was planning to divorce him? He had a right to know. I suspect it was less to do with his rights and more to do with an attempt to drive a wedge between him and his wife so that he would help you to try to bring her down. You don't deny, do you, that you and Mr. Marchant spent hours discussing this case during these visits? You were desperate to find any shred of evidence against her. I found evidence. That mobile phone bill proves she called him. It proves the phone was in use, not who was using it. But then, little facts like that don't seem to matter to you, do they, Mr. Tate? How can you say that? I've spent weeks assembling evidence for this case. And you've spent years following an obsession. You've hated Mrs. Marchant since her marriage to your father. With good reason. She killed him. No, 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 Mr. Tate. Those accusations have been proved false. Just as these will be. You've got to listen to me. I think the jury has heard more than enough from you by now, Mr. Tate. She can't get away with it again. No further questions. Thank you, Mr. Tate. Your witness, Mr. Keating.
Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. I'll lengthen odds against Kim being sent down. I'll give you 20 to 1 now. She must have had a good day in court then, eh? Lousy for Chris. Better reckon he's making a right fool on his son. Well, if I had my way, I'd lock him and her up together. Be perfect punishment for both of them. <laughs> You're much too early. What? Well, I just thought it'd take ages to get to Leeds. Yeah, but the cop I really fancy don't get warmed up till late. How late does this place stay out? We'll probably meet the milkman on our way out. I've got an early morning call tomorrow. Don't worry, I'll make sure you get back in time. I don't know what the attraction of these clubs is. All loud music and flashing lights. Well, there's no point asking me. It's when me and Paddy were together and never went anywhere when he had an early morning call. So when I got in bed, he was just dead to the world. Did you and your husband entertain often? Not since Steve's business went down. We don't have money for lavish dinner parties anymore. That's why I was pleased when he suggested inviting Zoe over. So this dinner was your husband's idea? Yes. Did it not strike you strange, therefore, when he chose to spend most of the evening upstairs? I suppose it should have done, but I'd got used to it. Steve's always been very secretive about his business calls. Some people might think you should have learned a lesson from that when he lost all your money. He promised to make up for what he'd done. I guess I wanted to believe him. I wanted the marriage to work. Why then did you decide to start divorce proceedings? When I realised what he was involved in. Not just stealing from me, but nearly killing Cathy. I saw that he lied to me all along. He was never going to change. There was no hope for us as a couple. I'm sure the jury can see that you made every effort to make your marriage work. Why did you not tell your husband you were planning to divorce him? Well, I was going to, but I wanted to talk the matter over with my solicitor first. By which time, Christopher Tate had already told him. Did that surprise you? Not at all. Chris has always done anything he can to hurt me. Including accusing you of murder. The police proved I was innocent of that. I hope the jury can see that these charges are just as ridiculous. Why do you think Mr. Tate persists in making these allegations? Uh, Frank, Chris's father, was a self-made man, a, a millionaire. Uh, Chris idolised him, wanted to follow in his footsteps, but Frank never thought he was up to it. In fact, he told me he despised him. Well, that's not true. He'd have never have said that. Mr. Tate, you must not interrupt these proceedings. Please continue, Mrs. Marchant. Thank you, Your Honour. When Frank turned to me to help run Home Farm, Chris couldn't take it. He had to pretend that I was plotting against him. Frank leaving me the business in his will was the final straw for him. This is lies, all lies! I will not tolerate these outbursts in my court. But she murdered him! Remove that man! Now she's making fools out of all of you. You can't let her get away with it! 